Hello brethren, and we would like to welcome you back again to BSM TV and we'd like to say again a blessed feast of Solomon and Pentecost. We thank God also for the lessons that we've been receiving throughout these two Sabbaths which were back to back, the seventh day Sabbath and also the feast of the ceremony Pentecost. Now, uh, what we want to do now, we're not going to have a long lesson because we've been learning so much, you know, continuously from the seventh day Sabbath on, in, on to the day of the ceremony of Pentecost. So I just want to have a, a, a short lesson which is going to uh, just pick a few points here and a few points there, we put them together, we pray to God and we hope that uh, by these few words, we may be blessed uh, as we wind down on this Feast of the Ceremony of Pentecost. Now, but before we enter our lesson, I just want to read for you some very interesting uh, quotation from the book Education, page 125. It says here, The central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters, is the redemption plan. The restoration in the human soul of the image of God. So you see, brethren, that from what inspiration is telling us here, that when we look at the Bible, when we look at the central theme or the objective why the Bible was written, the objective why the Bible was written is so that we as human beings may get salvation. We may know the plan of salvation. We may know how God is working to redeem us from what? From sin and from all uncleanness so that we are ready for his kingdom. Now, if we go to page 126, it continues and says here, uh, this is the highest study in which it is possible for men to engage. As no other study can, it will quicken the mind and uplift the soul. Okay. So, if, brethren, there is any study which at this moment we must be occupying our time in, it is the study to find out what are the things which God has put in place in order for us to be, right, to be redeemed. Okay. Because we remember, brethren, that, you know, when God is working for our salvation, the enemy is also right, working for our destruction. So all the instructions, each and everything that we can pick up, that God has put, that we can put together, that God is, is, is left for our instruction and for our opening of our eyes, so that we may see the path, these things, we must hold them dearly unto us, is it? Now, uh, this lesson that we're going to have today is titled, The House of David and the Harvest. So first of all, we want to understand uh, what the harvest is. And then when we've understood what the harvest is, we want to understand to say, what does the house of, of David got to do with the harvest? So these two things, as we're going to see, as we go ahead, they're actually, they're actually interconnected. And it is our privilege to understand from the scriptures to say, what do they have to do with our salvation? And so that we can be able to recognize the way that God is working and be able to, write, to be in unison uh, with this way for our salvation. So now, we want to revisit Matthew 18. We looked at it on Friday uh, as we welcome in the Sabbath day. But want to look at it just as a refresher in case maybe some of you may have missed that lesson. So we just want to look at the part of Matthew 18 and just pick a few points and then we'll go ahead, isn't it? So let us turn to Matthew 18, uh, if you can read for us, verse 24, 25, and 26. Verse 24. Yes. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, mm -hmm. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sold good seed in his field. Right. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat mm -hmm. and went his way. Right. But when the blood was sprung up mm -hmm. and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tears also. Do you see that? So we're being told here that there is a, you know, it's, we're being given a parable of a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, what happened? The enemy came and sowed tears in the, in the same field. And we're seeing here that now the, the servants started discovering that, oh, there is now a strange seed actually what, growing in the same, same field, isn't it? Now, I want you to jump and say, and go to uh, verse 27. Jump and go to verse 27. Verse, verse 27. Yes. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, mm -hmm. Say, did it not thou sow good seed in, this, in, in thy field? Right. From whence then he did taste? Do you see that? Mm -hmm. He said unto them, mm -hmm. an enemy done this. Mm -hmm. The servant said unto him, Would thou then we go and gather them up? Do you see that? Uh -huh. But he said, mm -hmm. Nay, lest while we gather, gather up the tares, mm -hmm. you root up also the wheat with them. With them. Do you see that? So now, we are being shown in this parable, brethren, that in this field that uh, this man had put the good seed, is it? The enemy came and what? And planted bad seed in that same field. Now, I think it's obvious and very clear, brethren, that when, when, when the wheat is growing, and the tares are planted amongst the wheat, the purpose of the tares is not to encourage the growth of the wheat. We know this from, you know, like from basic agriculture that 
these tears will compete with the wheat for sunlight, for you know, for space, for and, 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 and stuff like that. Can you see? So now we can easily tell from this from this description that the, the, the presence of the tears in the same field is not for the benefit of the wheat, but just to, uh, to disturb the growth of what of the wheat. So we're going to see when we now look at the interpretation or the explanation that Christ gave as to the meaning of this parable. But what I want us to see at this moment is to say, were these tears to continue to, to be a problem to the wheat forever? Or what was going to happen to these tears which are found uh, in the field? Isn't it? Let's read verse 30. Mm -hmm. Verse 30. Yes. Let both grow together until the harvest. Mm -hmm. And in the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, right. Gather ye together first the tares, mm -hmm. and bind them in bundles to bend them. Right. But gather the wheat into my barn. Do you see that? So when we look at this parable, it's very interesting, brethren, to note that when the servants noticed that there were actually tares in the field, and they wanted to take the tares out, the master said that if they try to take out the tares at that time, they may accidentally end up what? Uprooting the wheat. So it means that there was going to be a, you know, a difficulty in recognizing to say this is a tear and this is a wheat and eventually, you know, probably even maybe they would have actually uprooted the wheat and left the tears in that same field. So now the master said, hold on, but wait until the time of the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, the reapers will be sent forth into the field and what are the reapers going to do? They are going to bind the tears in bundles to burn them, isn't it? And then they are going to bind the wheat to add and gather it into, into the barn. So it's interesting, brother, now we need to understand according to this parable to say, who then are these reapers? Now, who are the tears? Who are the wheat? What is the field? And how do these things apply to us in this generation, isn't it? Now, I want to jump to verse 37, where now we see Christ explaining this parable to the disciples. Verse, verse 37 and 38. Verse 37. Yes. He answered, he answered and said unto them, mm -hmm. He that sowed the good seed is the son of man. So he that sowed the good seed is what is the son of man, and we know that is what? That is Christ. It's none other than Christ, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The field is the world. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Right. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. So now, do we see that? Now, we are being told that Christ put the good seed in the field. And what happened? The enemy came and also what? Sowed his own children in the same field. So this is what we are seeing here, brethren, right? Uh -huh. the, the, enemy, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. Mm -hmm. The harvest is the end of the world. So the harvest is the end of the world, isn't it? So let both grow together until the harvest. Or in other words, let the wheat and the tares were to grow together until the time of the end of the world. Now we're going to see that when, we're, when the parable say end of the world, does it mean second coming? We're going to look at that, isn't it? But the wheat and the tares were to grow together until the end of the world or until the time of the harvest, isn't it? Right? Let's go ahead. The, the enemy that saw them is the devil. Mm -hmm. The harvest is the end of the world. Right? And the reapers are the angels. Do you see that? So at the end of the world or at the time of the harvest, we are being told here, Christ is telling us that we must expect angels who are actually designated as what? As reapers. And these angels, the task that they have is actually to separate the wheat and the tares, to bind the wheat for the garner and to bundle the tares right, for the burning. And we're being told that this takes place at the time of the, of the harvest or at the time or somewhere at the end of the, of the world. So that's why our topic is titled The Harvest and the House of, of David. So now we have seen the, 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 when the harvest is actually to take place, we've also seen the, I mean, the necessity of the harvest. And why is the harvest important? It's because we realize that in the, in the field, there are both wheat and tares, children of the kingdom and children of what? Of the enemy. So now, I want us to go to uh, inspiration as we uh, further get elaboration uh, on these on this symbols and how to apply them and their significance or their bearing upon us today. With that in mind, shall we turn to Christ's object lesson, page, three, zero, page, 700, page 70, uh, paragraph 2. Paragraph 2. Yes. The food. Christ said, is the world. Right. But we must understand this as signifying the church of Christ in the world. Do you see that? So, the field is the world, but in actuality, the field is actually the church of Christ in the world. So, meaning that in the church that Christ himself established, there are now what? Wheat and tares. Yes. 
This is a situation that we're being told is existent in the, in, in the church, that when you look at the church, the fact that, you know, people are being baptized, the fact that, you know, the congregation is so full and some are even sitting outside and many branches are being open, isn't it? That doesn't mean that everyone is a, a wit, but it actually tells us that amongst this congregation, they are both wheat and tares. And it's difficult to tell by our own human eyes. Therefore, at the time of the harvest, the angels or the reapers are the ones who are given the commission, who are given the, 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 the ability to tell between the two and therefore try uh, to do a work of separation or a work of, of harvest. Now, I want us to go again. We want to find out because we're told in Matthew 13 that uh, he who sought the good seed is the son of man or it is Christ. So at which point did Christ actually saw this good seed? Isn't it? Let us go to chapter number 3, page 57, uh, paragraph 2, where he says what? With the sowing. Paragraph 2. Yes. With the sowing of the seed beginning with Christ's baptism mm -hmm. and the harvest coming at the end of the world. Right. The period of the parable obviously embraces the entire gospel dispensation. Do you see that? So, the period of the parable of Matthew 18 embraces the entire gospel dispensation. From the time that Christ was baptized up to the end of the, of the world, isn't it? What else does it say? From the beginning of Christ's ministry uh -huh. to the close of probationary time. Do you see that? So, from the beginning of the ministry of Christ to the close of probationary time, this is the period that actually encompasses this parable of Matthew 13. From the time that Christ began his ministry, that which is after his baptism, because that's the time when we actually went outward to preach, isn't it? And it goes on up to the time when probation closes. Now, what is interesting, brethren, uh, remember we were told that the harvest is at the end of the world. But we're going to note as we go down that probation doesn't actually take place at the second coming of Christ. Yes. Probation doesn't take place at the second coming of Christ. The end of probation doesn't take place at the coming of Christ. By the time Christ comes at the second coming, probation would have long lost. The decision, the, the decision as to who is, is, is wicked and who is righteous would have long, uh, long, been, right, long been made before that. Can you see? So it means that the harvest is a, is a time which actually takes place sometime before the second coming. That's the time when the decisions will be made to say, this is the wheat and this is what, this is a tear, isn't it? Go down with the same quotation where it says, the three and one half years. Uh, it says, yes. the three and, and one, sorry, the three and one half years from the beginning of Christ's ministry to the mm -hmm. crucifixion, right. being, being the sowing time, mm -hmm. and the harvest time being uh, the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Then the intervening period is the time for the growing and the ripening of the of the grain, right? Also, the tear sowing time. The tear sowing time, is it? So well, now we see that uh, from for three and a half years, which is from his baptism up to his crucifixion, Christ was actually engaged in a work of what sowing the good seed. And then after that, he then left seven to take care of this field. But as when he left, what happened? The men slept, and the enemy came and sowed bad seed in that same field or in the church of God. And therefore, this now necessitates right, a time of harvest. Because in other words, if there were no tears in the church, then when Christ comes, you would have just come and taken the whole field and, and, you know, into the kingdom. But now, in order for the good seed or the wheat to be taken into the field, there, there is a time designated as the time of harvest, where reapers are sent forth into the field, or we are told that the, these reapers are actually right, angels. Because the servants couldn't distinguish between a wheat and a tear. So therefore, reapers or angels had to be sent forth into the field so that they may write, they might get to say, this one is a tear and this one is what? Is a wheat. So we're going to look at more into this aspect to say, what does it exactly mean when it is when we are being told that reapers are the, are the angels, isn't it? Now, I want to go with that question in mind. Let's go to three track again, page 58, paragraph, uh, page 66, sorry, paragraph three. Three tract, page 66, paragraph 3. Where it says the reapers? It says, mm -hmm. The reapers are, are the angels, right? Who shall come forth and sever the wicked from the just, right? Mm -hmm. These angels are not the, uh, those who shall come with Christ at his second coming, right? But rather, mm -hmm. those whom he, uh, he shall send forth. Do you see that? So we are being taught here by inspiration that the angels who are called the reapers are not the angels who are going to come with Christ at his second coming. But these are the angels that Christ is going to send forth. 
So let us read and, and get more information on that point. Z. They are like? They are like the three angels of Revelation chapter 14, right. 6 through 11. Do you see that? So these angels who are designated as the reapers, we are being told here by inspiration that they are like the angels of Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 to 11. And what do we see in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 to 11? We all agree, brethren, that we've got the three angels' messages there. We've got three angels' messages. In other words, we've got angels coming with messages. And these, these messages are come, came through what human beings or instrumentalities. Do you see that? God, actually, what God did is that he gave the message to, what, to human beings who then preached this message to the church. So what we're seeing here, brethren, is that the reapers of uh, Matthew 13 are actually angels with messages. It's an angel with a message, as we're going to see, as we're going to get more elaboration as we go down, isn't it? Now, continue with the quotation and hear what it says. Indeed, the third angel is to select the wheat from the tail. Right. And seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. So this is L writings page uh, 118. Now, we are being told that indeed, the third angel's message is the one to what? Do this work of selection, selecting what? The tares from the wheat. Binding the, 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 the wheat for what? For the heavenly garner. So I want to get more elaboration on this point as we go down, isn't it? Finish it up, therefore. Therefore, mm -hmm. the angels, right. the reapers, whom Christ sent forth, mm -hmm. include both him who does the sealing or binding, right. and those who follow on to do the destroying, according to uh, Ezekiel 9, verse 2, 5, and 6. Right. First in the church, then and then in the world. Do you see that? So, the, 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 the angels who are the reapers, whom Christ sent forth, isn't it? They include those who do the work of sealing, isn't it? And those who follow on to what to do the work of destroying. So meaning that when we are talking about the harvest, or when we are talking about that angels are being sent forth into the field to do a work of harvest, what must we be looking for, brethren? We must be looking for a work of sealing. And what happens after the work of sealing? There is another work of destruction. Yes. Do you see that? Um. So that's why we're saying, brethren, that now, if this was necessary, if everything was okay in the field, if every individual in the field or in the church was actually a witch, there would not be a necessity for this work. But because the enemy came and put bad seed into that same field, now there is this work of inspecting each and every individual before everyone is taken into, what, into the kingdom of God. So many parables actually teach about this thing. We've, we've got, for instance, Matthew 25, about the, 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 the ten virgins. Some of them are wise, some of them are, are foolish. We've got even another parable whereby a king made a feast for his wife, for his son. But before the wedding actually started, there was an inspection and there was found among those who had been invited, one who was not putting on the wedding garment. So it, what does it mean, brethren? It means that not all who say, Lord, Lord, will surely enter the kingdom. Which means that we as individuals need to check ourselves and say, where exactly are we standing with God? Are we in the sight of the wheat or are we in the sight of what? Of the tares? Now, we are being told here, brethren, that at the time of the harvest, reapers will be sent forth into the field. Who are these reapers? The reapers are the angels. And these angels are likened to the angels of Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 to 11. And now, these angels, what do they have? They've got messages. And when these messages are being broadcasted into the church, what is happening? A work of sealing is actually taking place. And a work of binding together the tears is actually taking place. Now, you can imagine, brethren, that, you know, now that in this field, they are both subjects of, of, of God and subjects of, of the enemy. So what it means is that when God then comes with a sitting message into the same church, what is going to happen? Those who actually identify themselves with God, the children of God, because now God says that my sheep hear my voice. So the children of God who hear the message and know that this is the voice of God, this is the voice of God in the same church. But the children of the wicked one, who are the tares, they will not be able to recognize that the message is of God. But interestingly enough, again, in that same church, when the enemy utters his voice, what are the children of the wicked one going to do? They are going to actually accept that voice. So now we've got two voices being uttered into the same people. The one voice is coming from God to seal the children, or, or the, the children of the kingdom. The other voice is from, what? It's from the enemy. Can you see? Yes. And all this is coming to the same church, meaning that this is a time, brethren, for me and you to decide 
where exactly we are standing in terms of salvation or in terms of what? Destruction. Life is what? what we make a decision. Now, I want us to want to revisit uh, any writings page 118 because we are told that the third angel's message is the one which actually does this work of separation, isn't it? Let us go to any writings page 118. Uh, paragraph one. I saw. I then saw. I then saw the third angel. Mm -hmm. Said my company angel. Right. Fearful is his work. Mm -hmm. Awful is his mission. Right. He is the message that is to select the wheat from the tares mm -hmm. and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly gun. Do you see that? No. Not what is interesting with this quotation is Now this is Sister White. She's in vision, isn't? And she says here, I then saw the third angel. Remember that Sister White. She is the one with the third angel's message in that generation when she was writing these things, isn't? But she's saying here, I then saw the dead angel, isn't it? Said my accompanying angel, fearful is his work. Now, if, if you read uh, through the books of Elamite, uh, there's one brethren who asked and said, how do you know that the visions or the dreams that you have, they're actually from God? Because, I mean, anyone can dream. And the answer that she gave was that because the same angel who I always see in all of my visions, and dreams is always present, giving me instruction. So meaning what? Meaning that this angel who was always besides Ellen White, this is the angel who was giving Ellen White the third angel's message. But this angel who was giving Ellen White the third angel's message is telling her or showing her another work of the third angel's message which wasn't happening at that time. Otherwise, this, 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 this statement would have read and said, uh, it would have said, fearful is my work, because remember, this is, this is the accompanying angel of Ellen White who is speaking this way, isn't it? The angel would have said, fearful is my work, awful is my mission, isn't it? I am the angel who is to select the wheat from the test. But that angel is not saying that. Meaning that at that time, or during the time of Ellen White uh, in her days, this work of separation was not then taking place. But the angel was showing me another phase of the third angel's message, which was to take place at a later stage, and that work was to result in a fearful work, a work of separating the wheat from the tares. Get that? Can you take it again uh, and finish it up as we digest uh, on this point, isn't it? I then saw. I then saw the third angel, mm -hmm. save my company angel. Right. Fearful is his work. Mm -hmm. Awful is his mission. Right. He's the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares. Uh huh. And seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly gun. Do you see that? These things should engross the whole mind, the whole attention. The whole attention. So, brethren, if our destiny, you know, if our desire is for us to be gathered to the heavenly gun, then we must investigate these matters to understand this angel, you know, the work that this angel does. Because if we don't understand that this, the work that this angel is doing, we may be found on the wrong side. So it is our privilege, brethren, that we look deep into this issue so that we may know and understand exactly what this angel is doing and the work that this angel is doing, so that we also what may be numbered on the correct side, isn't it? Now, let's go more and look at into this issue, isn't it? Uh, can you turn to last day events, page 201.6, isn't it? Because the third angel's message has got a, a, a unique announcement, yes. has got a unique warning, which is the warning against worshipping the beast. Do you see that? Yes. So, meaning what? Meaning that here in this world, We've got people who worship the beast and we've got people what who worship God. So this is what the third angel's message is emphasizing on. So, but we want to look at some very interesting points uh, in regards to this matter, isn't it? LTE, page 201.6. The mark? Paragraph 6. Yes. The mark of the beast is enforced in the forehead or in the hand mm -hmm. just before the coming of the Son of Man. Right. As shown in Revelation 13 and 14. Do you see that? So before the coming of the Son of Man, before the second coming, there is a period of the enforcement of the mark of the beast. That's why many times people say, oh, Jesus is coming anytime. The first night we need to look at, the first night we need to expect in the line of prophecy is the enforcement of the mark of the beast. Isn't it? Because this happens before the coming of the Son of Man. Right? What else does it say? It says, mm -hmm. but we see also that the seal right? or mark of God is placed in the forehead of his servants in that same time. In that same time. So at the time when, you know, because I know many people, they are concerned about the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is that, the mark of the beast is that, 666 ETC is that. And, and up to a point by so many conspiracy theories actually being, you know, raised uh, left, right and center. But our safety, brethren, is to be sealed. You know, they, they, they say that if you want to know what error is, you don't have to concern yourself with starting error. You know, 
What you simply have to do is to start at the truth, and when you start at the truth, anything that is not truth is what is error. Yes. So now here we're being told that at the time when the mark of the beast is being enforced, which is before the coming of the Son of Man, at that same time, what is happening? The sealing of the servants of God is also at taking place. Remember what we read on top is about the harvest. That when we're looking at the harvest, this is the time of what of sealing and a time of what destroying the wicked people. So meaning that the harvest, as we have already seen before, takes place before the second coming. And at the time of the harvest, what must we, what must we be expecting? What must we be looking at? We must be looking at the sealing of the servants of God. Not only the sealing of the servants of God, but also this, the, the marking of those who receive the mark of the beast. Now remember the beast is a man, isn't it? The beast is a man. And what this simply means, brethren, is that there are now two voices in the church. The voice of God sealing the wheat for the garner, and the voice of the beast sealing the tears for what? Unfortunately, for destruction. Unfortunately, for destruction. And remember again, we've learned uh, this, this point which on, on base until several times that the beast is a man. So whatever you know, someone may be instructing which is not found in a dust, says the Lord, be careful and not if are you listening to God or are you listening to the beast? Because the beast instructs people to do a certain uh, something in, in, in the critics of worship, but under his authority, not under the authority of God. Yes. You understand? So, for instance, just to give you a good example, you know, we, we, we see people um, keeping the Lord's Supper more than once a year, every quarter. You know? We see, for instance, maybe people decide to, to say, no, I think for us it's convenient to keep the care meeting at that date or at that date. But ask yourself the question, from whom is that instruction coming from? Time is important, brethren. We saw, we saw Jeroboam changing the times of the Lord, changing even the venue for the keeping of the Feast of the Tabernacles, and he was not left unpunished. So now, we need to not to say, what I am doing, who is instructing it? From where is that person getting the instruction or getting that commandment? If it is from men, then be very careful. Because you will be receiving the mark of the beast. But if it is from God, then you are safe because you know that you are doing the will of what? You are doing the will of God, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, I want us to quote down, uh, having, having, having read this part, said, finish that quotation, then we'll go to another one. It says here, yes. But we see also that the seal or mark of God is mm -hmm. placed in the foreheads of his servants in that same time. In that same time. The, therefore, right? they stand over against one another. So there, there is now like these two sides. The, the size of the seal of, of God and the size of the mark of the beast, the size which the wheat will occupy and the size which the tares will naturally occupy. Because in that parable of Matthew 18, we, we were never told that a wheat will turn into a tear or a tear will turn into a wheat. The harvest simply exposes who is who. When everything has been disguised before, but the harvest isn't, exposes who is who isn't. What else does it say? Therefore, they mm -hmm. stand over one against another. Right. One marking those who are saved mm -hmm. when Jesus, sorry, when Lord Jesus comes. Right. The other, mm -hmm. those who suffer the last seven plagues. Can you see that? So, before Jesus comes, before we can talk about the second coming, in order for us to get to the second coming, we must actually go through this time of separation. Amen. If we cannot survive this time of separation, if we don't know, you know, what God is using to separate, then how, how can we then talk about the second coming? It's like a person who's talking about an exam, but they're not preparing for the exam. You can't speak about the exam when you're not preparing for it. We don't even know what the syllabus is contained, the textbooks or the content of the exam. Automatically, you fail that exam. Do you see that? So long before Christ comes, there is this work of what? Of separation. There's this work of, you know, what, what he says, uh, he will gather his gems for his kingdom. These, these, are, these are hymns that we always sing, isn't it? Another one which says, you know, where are the reapers? With sickles of truth must the work be done. Amen. So the separation was the sickles are the ones which actually harvest, but with sickles of truth. So before the second coming, we as a church, we are supposed to expect a work whereby messages will be sent amongst us. And those messages are actually coming to expose, to say who is a wheat and who is a tear. And depending on our response, brethren, 
we are actually separated or bound in bundles. You know, if you look at people who support football, you know, one person, let's say they support maybe Team A, is like, those who support Team A, when they are supporting their team, they are so united. It doesn't matter whether one ate, you know, one drank beer, one drank, uh, you know, Fanta when they left home, or one drank water. They all bind up together to support their team. And those who support the other team B, they do the same. So what does it mean? It means that in the time of the harvest, as the messages of the selling are going forth, isn't what is happening to those who accept the message of selling? They actually bind, uh, you know, bind themselves together. Those who also reject what happens to them, they are also bound together. Do you see that? So just this is exactly what is happening, and that is why when we look at the writings, it says that the 144,000 were all perfectly sealed, and what? They were then perfectly united. Because it is the truth of God which, what, which unites the people into one denomination or into one item. Can you see? Well, those again who are on the wrong side, they are also united by, it, by their opposition to the truth. And God is looking and noting all our responses and what? Making up the names for his kingdom. Or making up the gems for his kingdom, as we want to say. Isn't it? Now, I want us to go again. Uh, let's go to. Uh, finish it up, actually. We haven't finished it. There's an important point there. Finish it up. It says, mm -hmm. as foretold in the 18th of Revelation. Right. The third angel's message is to be proclaimed with great power by, uh, by those right. who give the final warning against uh, the beast and his image. Do you see that? So we are told here, brethren, that as foretold in the what? 18th chapter of Revelation. The 18th chapter of Revelation. What happens there? The third angel's message is to be. This, this is in my writing. That the third angel's message is to be. Meaning that she was putting the Revelation 18 future to her time. The third angel's message is to be proclaimed with great power by those who give what the final warning against the beast and his image. So now one, one may ask and say, why would Re uh, the Revelation chapter 18 repeat the warning against the beast and his image if from 1844, from Revelation chapter 14 verse 9 to 11, if these things were sorted out? Why would Revelation chapter 18 then come and speak the same words about the warning against the beast and his image if that work had been complete? Do you see that? So this is what we want to find out, isn't it? Let us go to uh, the words of Ellen White herself who was given the third angel's message and she is writing under inspiration the following words. And these words are not being written to anyone else out there but they are written to us who accepted the third angel's message, isn't it? 6T, which is testimonies for the church volume 6, Page 406, paragraph 4, where it says we are to throw aside... Paragraph 4. Yes. We are to throw aside our narrow selfish plans, mm -hmm. remembering that we have a work of the largest magnitude and highest importance. Do you see that? Uh -huh. in, do in doing this work, mm -hmm. we are sounding the first, first second, second, and third angel's message. Right. And are thus being prepared for the coming of that, uh, that other angel uh -huh. from heaven, right. who is to lighten the earth with his glory. Do you see that? So Ellen White is telling us, brethren, that we, not they, like the people out there, that we will accept the dead angel's message, must not be narrow. Isn't it? We mustn't be narrow. We must throw aside this narrowness. And because when we are preaching the first, the second, and the third angel's message, we are but just preparing for another additional message. Can you see that? And which message is this? The message that is to come to lighten the earth with the glory of God. You know, it's, it's, it's like people who go, to, uh, who go to certain countries to maybe study uh, in higher tertiary education. And then they are told that, okay, for you to do this degree in, in engineering, you need to first actually go through one year, which is called prep school. So this prep school, you are going to be learning the language, not the degree, but the language which is going to be used in, when, when you now actually start learning uh, the content of your degree. To qualify you for a profession which you intend to, isn't it? So imagine when a person that then goes to prep school and then when they are done with prep school, prep school which is one year, and they, they now know the language, but then they say that they, they now have a degree. Will that even make sense? Obviously not, isn't it? So now the three angels' messages are just at prep school. They are preparing for the other angel who is to come and lighten the earth with the glory of God. This is exactly the caution or the direction which we're given under the third angel's message 
to say that wait for another job. The work is not complete. Wait for another work, wait for another angel who is to come enlighten the earth with the glory of God. Listen. Now, let us go and, and, and look more into this issue. Why would Ellen White, after having proclaimed a warning against worshipping the beast, then say, wait for another warning, which is Revelation 18, and we've seen that uh, Revelation chapter 18 also comes to give a final warning against worshipping the beast. Why would Revelation 18 come and warn the same thing which we've been warned before? To get that answer, shall we turn to Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 17, paragraph 1. Paragraph 1. Yes. The light we have received upon the third angel's message is the true light. Right. The mark of the beast is exactly what it has been proclaimed to be. Mm -hmm. Not all in regard to this matter is yet understood. Right. Nor will it be understood until the unrolling of the scroll. Do you see that? But a most solemn work is to be accomplished in our world. So, brethren, the third angel's message was very clear. That yes, we, we, we know a portion as to what the mark of the beast is. But not everything had been explained or had been elaborated under the third angel's message. Therefore, the missing part is now being brought by what? The angel of Revelation chapter 18. And we are being told, now remember, this is a very important message. Because we are told in Ed Writings 118 that this message is the one which is going to separate the wheat from the tares. Because there are two voices there. Isn't it? This message comes to warn that there are actually two voices involved here. The voice of God, which is sealing the children, children for the kingdom of God, and the mark of the beast, which is marking the wicked for destruction. And the beast is a man. Can you see that? Now, let us go again as, 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 as we look into it more into this, into this issue. Isn't it? Go to end writings, page 277, paragraph 1. We want to see that when the angel of Revelation chapter 18 comes, where exactly does this angel go? Is it where exactly does it go? EW277, paragraph 1. Right. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, mm -hmm. descending to the earth and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. Right. Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth, uh -huh. to unite his voice with the third angel, right. and give power and force to his message. Mm -hmm. great, po great power and glory were imparted to the angel right. as it descended, uh, the earth was lightened with, with his, his glory. glory. Do you see that? So this angel comes and unites his voice with the third angel and gives it power and, and force. If you read in uh, last day events, there's a topic there which is called the loud cry. Where Ellen White says that this angel of Revelation chapter 18 is indeed the third angel's message in verity. They are actually the same. You, in other words, you, you, you can accept the message of Revelation chapter uh, 14 verse 9 to 11 and yet reject this one. Because what this one is coming to do is coming to unite his voice with the third angel and give it power and force. Or speak more about the issue of the mark of the beast because under Revelation chapter 14 verse 9 to 11 not all was said in regards to exactly what the mark of the beast is now remember we know that the beast is a is a man and under under the third angel's message uh, we know that we, we know this as a fact that what the men what the men did during the dark ages is that the men changed the laws of God and supplanted them with his own laws is that we agree that he took away the Sabbath and put what the first day of the week as a day of worship. But not only did he change the Sabbath, he changed even many other things which, must, which pertain to how we must worship God, which identify us as worshiping God. Because when we read it from Paul in the Thessalonians, Paul says that he will exalt himself above the Most High. Can you see? Anything and everything that is worshipped, you know, that you will go against that. So now, what is happening here, brethren, is that we're going to see that in the church at the moment, one, yes, we may have passed on the issue of the Sabbath, but there are other things which need our attention in how we worship God, and in particular, the festivals. Because these same festivals, we see them being supplanted in the time of the Dark Ages. And later on, even up to date, we see individuals, instead of working to restore the law of God to its rightful place, we see individuals even placing their own dates for the laws of God. And what do we, you know, you know, how, what can we call that? You know, under whose authority will such individuals be instructing 
the, the worship of God to be carried forward without a thus says the Lord. That's the same thing that happened in the dark ages whereby men came and said, no, we have seen it better to worship on the first day of the week. And then today what are we seeing? We see men again saying, ah, we have seen it better that, oh no, we don't, we don't trouble you guys, we don't trouble you guys. I think you can just, you know, keep, keep, keep the, the Lord's Supper during the day at 11 a.m. in the morning, four times a day, just make it plenty. You understand? We see people saying, no, 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 don't trouble the people, you know, to keep the, the, the care meeting in the seventh biblical month, but let them keep it when it's convenient. Some keep it in April, some keep it in, you know, in August, you know, it is it. But under whose authority is such activities taking place? There is no that says the Lord. But at the same time, when, this, when, when the beast is enforcing the, this kind of worship, which is not biblical, what is happening? God is also sealing his children. In other words, God is bringing us back to the true worship. And this is where, brethren, we are going to see that the house of David then now comes in. We are going to look at that short lesson. But before we go ahead, I want us to, us to look at a very few interesting points about the message of Revelation chapter 18, isn't it? Can you go to Great Controversy 88, uh, page 382, paragraph 3? You see what it says, furthermore. Furthermore, yes. in the 18th chapter of Revelation, mm -hmm. in a message yet future. Do you see that? So now, Ellen White is telling us that this is, this is in her day. She is saying that in the 18th chapter of Revelation, in a message which is yet future, meaning that at her generation or in her days, this message had not yet actually been proclaimed. It wasn't being proclaimed. But future, we were supposed to look for, we were supposed to expect this message to come to us, isn't it? And then it says here, the people of God are called out upon to come out of Babylon. So the message of Revelation chapter 18, that, that message is calling people out of Babylon. Do you see that? Right? Let's go to another, uh, another one, GC 88, 604.1. Well, it says, hence the movement. Hence the movement symbolized by the, by the angel mm -hmm. coming down from heaven, right. lightening the earth with his glory, mm -hmm. and crying mightily with a strong voice announcing the sins of Babylon. Do you see that? So, hence the movement. So, when this message of uh, Revelation chapter 18 was predicted to come, Ellen White actually saw a movement in connection with that message. And that message is actually uh, calling people to come out of Babylon. In other words, that message is actually defining exactly what Babylon is. Because you cannot come out of something that you don't know what it is. You, it's, nobody can say come out of Babylon when, when you don't even know what the definition of Babylon is. Some time ago, we know, we, 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 learned, we learned about this issue of Babylon, isn't it? From, it starts from the time of Nimrod, isn't it? The one who built the Tower of Babel. And we, we, we learned that all these Easter's, all these, you know, this one January, all these 25 December's, this is where they originate from. And these are the very things that we, we see even being done, even in the midst of the church. Right now, 25 December is not far. You will even see Christmas trees in the church. But then you ask yourself, this kind of practice, these are the practices of Babylon. Now in the church, who brought them? Is it the witch? Of course not. But it's the tears who brought them into the church. Can you see that? 1 January, we see people actually saying Happy New Year on 1 January, but is it even in the Bible? These are the customs of Babylon which were instituted so many years, years ago, and which the people are now at following these customs. Yet the law of God is there being trampled underfoot by the wicked people. Can you see that? So now, the message of Revelation chapter 18 comes and defines exactly what Babylon is, and comes and calls the people to come out of Babylon. And like, as we have looked at uh, uh, before in the parable of Matthew, Matthew 18, only the wheat will hit this call. Because the tears, was there, you know, they're from Babylon, obviously they will not even say anything. They will actually oppose the message. That is why, brethren, it is very important for us, as individuals, to actually weigh the message. But some people say, oh no, I'm going to accept the message. I'll first see if so-and-so accepts the message. But do you know if so-and-so is a wheat or is a tear? Can you see that? Go down and we hear more what it says. It says, yes. in connection with, with his message, mm -hmm. the call is heard. Mm -hmm. Come out of there, my people. Right. These announcements, mm -hmm. uniting with the third angel's message, right. constitute the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. Do you see that? The final warning to be given, which was, you know, in the scriptures, which, which we were taught in the scriptures clearly, that it is going to be the final warning before the end. The final warning is the 
angel of Revelation chapter 18 uniting with the message of the third angel. So in other words, when, when we have the third angel only, we don't have the final warning. But only when we've got this other message which unites with the third angel, then do we have the final warning. And this warning will separate the inhabitants of the world into two classes. To separate the inhabitants of, you know, the, the, the members of the church into two classes, either those as wheat or those as what? As tares. The sheep of God will hear the voice of God, and those who are not the sheep of God, you know, they will hear something else. And the writing says they will hear thunder and lightning. Now, they will not even understand, is it? Now, I want us, in closing, I want us to, 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 to read one scripture, is it? And then we're going to look at some, some interesting points on that scripture. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8. Right. In that day mm -hmm. shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Yes. And he that is feeble among them, and that, uh, that day shall be as David. Right. And the house of David shall be as God, mm -hmm. as the angel of the Lord before them. Do you see that? So now, remember we learned that each scripture contains the plan of redemption. Yes. So now, Zechariah was telling us that there is a day that there is going to be what? A house of, of David. I'm not going to look at, at the other aspects of the scripture, but what I, what I want us to capture is that Zechariah was shown a day when there will be a house of David. Now, we've learned so much about this on this platform, uh, the past Sabbath, uh, in relation to uh, the theocratic government and the judgment of the living. We've learned to say that why is that David is the one who is the type of the leadership of this generation? Can you see that? We've learned all these things then. Because we, we cannot have a house of David without the David. So somebody who is a David in this generation was seen or was shown to Zechariah in other words. And because God would have selected such an individual, therefore now there is what we call the house of David. I want to read just one scripture on that point, and then we are going to read some things. Can you go again to Hosea chapter 3? Hosea chapter 3, uh, verse Four and five. Hosea three, verse four and five. Verse four. Yes. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, mm -hmm. and without a prince, right? And without a sacrifice, and without an image, mm -hmm. and without an effort, and without an, a, a, a teraphim, right? Verse five. Yes. Af afterward shall the children of Israel return, and seek the Lord their God, uh -huh. and death their king, right? And shall fear the Lord and His goodness in the latter days. Do you see that? So now this is. The same thing which was shown to to Isaiah. In actual fact, you know, when you, there are so many scriptures which which talk about this individual, you know, including Ezekiel, isn't Ezekiel thirty six, Ezekiel thirty seven, so many other scriptures, Ezekiel twenty. You know, they all speak about this David in this generation. But what I like about Isaiah is Isaiah says here, afterward, let me read it in Good News actually. It says, but the time will come when the people of Israel will once again return to the Lord their God and to a descendant of David, their king. Do you see that? They will fear the Lord and will receive his good gifts. The, good, the King James said that in the latter days. So returning to the Lord, is it? returning to the Lord also involves returning to David, the king. And now, because now there is David, what then do we see? We see the house of David. Do you see that? Now, I want us to read something very interesting about this house of David, isn't it? Can you turn to uh, Shepherd's Road? If you turn to Shepherd's Road, which is 2 Shepherd's Road, page 291, you'll see what it says, as recorded in the 47th chapter. As recorded in the 47th chapter. Because we, we learned that uh, Revelation chapter 18 is actually what? A movement. We learned that Revelation 18 was future to energy, right? And we learned that Revelation 18 is a message which actually uh, declares the sins of Babylon. What Babylon is. Can you see? So let's read this quotation and we see uh, something interesting there. As recorded. As recorded in the 47th chapter of Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. Sorry. As recorded in the 47th chapter. Right. Ezekiel was shown in vision certain particulars of the temple building some years before the Israelites were made free from the Babylonian captivity. Right. Mm -hmm. It has been previously explained that the temple erected after the captivity was a type of, the, uh, of this particular church in the time of the loud cry, do, 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 house do, of David. Do you see that? So the temple erected after their captivity was a type, not that not the temple is a church, is it? So that temple was a type, uh, sorry, of this particular church in the time of 
the loud cry struck the house of David. So do you see now where the house of David actually comes into the picture when we are speaking about Revelation chapter 18? The church, which is as a, you know, when the message of Revelation chapter 18 comes, it comes through the house of David. Can you see? So now, what we're seeing here is that Zechariah was, was seen, was, was shown actually the rebuild of the temple after their Babylonian captivity. So you can imagine that when they were in Babylon, obviously they were not washing God accordingly. Just to give you a good example, remember when the time when, 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 when those uh, three Hebrews were, were cast into the, flame, uh, into the flame because they didn't kneel to the image? Where were the other, you know, where were the other people? Because we only hear about three. What happened to the other ones? Do you see that? So when, when the Israelites were in Babylon, there was a lot of compromise happening there. But coming out of Babylon meant the restoration of the true worship of God. And we are being taught here that this church which is being built after this Babylonian captivity, can you see, this church is called the house of David. We once learned a lesson some time ago which talks about the four angels bound in the, in the, in the, in the river Euphrates. The four angels which when God preaches, they are going to enable us to escape being, kept, uh, being, being caught up in Babylon. These are the messages which will help us to open our eyes to understand what Babylonianism is. So that we may be, will not be found worshipping according to the men of Babylon. Can you see that? Right? Finish it up, then we go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It says, Therefore, Therefore, the river coming out from the temple according to Ezekiel's vision mm -hmm. is applicable at this time. At this time. And is, and is but the expansion of, the, of, of this fountain right. that is to be in the house of David, the church. Which is the church, right? From the fountain flows the mighty river seen in Ezekiel's vision. Right. Let us go again to another scripture. I think this is clear. Let us go now to... Um, I, want, I want you to go to uh, 1 TG, 1 TG number 9, page 10. 1 TG number 9, page 10. You will see what it says. Now, what is the overall purpose of the house of David? Now, mm -hmm. what is the overall purpose of the house of David? Yeah, we want to get that answer. The house of, yes. the house of David, mm -hmm. the scripture reveal is being built for the threefold purpose. Right. One, during the ingathering of the people, mm -hmm. it is to build the old, old west. Right. To raise up the former desolations mm -hmm. and to repair the west cities. Right. The desolations of many generations. Do you see that? So the house of David, like what we've seen before, is being built at this time, which is the time of the loud cry. To actually restore the true worship of God. Can you see that? To restore the true worship of God in a nutshell, isn't it? Because that is exactly what they did when they came from Babylon back to Jerusalem. They actually rebuilt the temple and restarted again the true worship of God. That's why you see today we're keeping the ceremony of Pentecost. We're keeping all the Feast of Tabernacles at the proper time. The daily communion is being kept at the proper time. Because these are the services which are actually done when the temple is now in operation. But in Babylon, we see people, you know, they'd forgotten about all those things. But the house of David, or the now Christ church, is raised up to bring again the true worship of God. But when, it when, when the house of David is preaching this message, in, you know, what is interesting is that they, it results in a separation. It results in a sealing of the service of God. Because those, some will accept and be sealed. But others would not accept, because remember, when you read the history of the, of the children of Israel, some even remained in Babylon. They remained in Babylon. So they never pa participated in this restoration of the true worship of God. And what, and what is happening when all these things are happening? God is looking and saying, okay, all you guys were pretending. Now I know who's who. Now I know who's who. Can you see that? Finish it and then be quiet. Uh -huh. It says, yes. this work of rebuilding and restoring, mm -hmm. Yes, it's time the rebuilding of ancient Jerusalem by the ancient Jews right. returning from their Babylonian captivity to the land of their fathers. So there's a, this is a type, and when there's no type, there's no, there's no truth, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Just as they were to build the west, right. the former desolations, the temple of the Lord, mm -hmm. the city and the walls, and to, and to restore the worship of God according right. to, to the Lord. So on divine will. According to the Lord's own divine will. That's what we're asking, brethren. When you see yourself going to camp meeting in April, going to camp meeting in August, according to whose divine will are you, are you, are you going? If you are keeping the, the, the Lord's Supper four times a year, not even having the death and the ninth hour, not even having the Feast of Pentecost, according to whose design are you, are you, are you operating? 
We need to question that question, isn't it? We need to ask ourselves that question. Because when Peter comes here, when Paul comes here, they will all say, when is the Feast of Pentecost? When is the Passover? When is the Daily Communion? Because they kept all those things in the New Testament. Against that. Go down with it. Uh -huh. Let me read so again. So we too. So, mm -hmm. okay. So we too now, mm -hmm. in the antitypical in gathering, right. are called to do a similar work. A similar work? Only much greater, both in scope and proportion. And in proportion, right? We must therefore labor even, even more than they labored, uh -huh. and be happy and thankful for having been privileged mm -hmm. to have a part in such a great and glorious work. Do you see that? So this is the kind of work that we're doing, which was done when they came from Babylon, but which is even at a much greater scope. Because when they, came, when they come from Babylon, it was just one country. But now what has happened is that the children of God are scattered throughout the whole world. Because we learned that the, 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 the field is the church. And in the field, that's where we'll find the children of God, isn't it? But the church is now scattered everywhere throughout the world. But in returning back to the land, it's actually even a more big task than it was when they just came from one country, which is what? Which is Babylon, isn't it? So I want you to read where it says, uh, what Daniel says, in addition to this great and grand work. So this is uh, 1 TG, page 10, paragraph 2. Mm -hmm. Paragraph 2, it yes. says, In addition to this great and grand work, mm -hmm. while in God's hand, as a, uh, as a battle axe, right. he that is, he sorry, is, sorry, he is with, so let me take it again. Okay. In addition to this great and grand work, mm -hmm. while in God's hand as a battle egg, right. he is with it to break the gentle shore, right. which now rests upon the shoulders of God's people. Mm -hmm. With it, he is to uh, emancipate his people from general rule, from Assyria, from, Assyria, from, from Egypt, Egypt, from Pathros, from uh -huh. Cush, from Elam, mm -hmm. from Shina, from Hamath, right. uh, from, the, uh, from the islands of the sea. Do you see that? So that is Isaiah chapter 11, verse what? Verse 11. So with this house of David, God intends to release his children who are scattered all over the world from, from Patros, from Cush, from Elam, from all those, from all those places and release them back to where? Back to the land of Canaan. Because in, in Osiah it says that when the children, afterwards tell the children of Israel, return. Return where? Where they were before. And seek the Lord their God and David their king. Do you see that? So now with this theocratic government that we've been learning all along, God is mobilizing again his children back to the land, out of Babylon, back to the land of, of, of promise. Do you see that? With it, with it, mm -hmm. he is to set up an ensign for the nation, right? And to assemble the outcasts of Israel and right. gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So that is why brethren were saying that this is happening at the harvest time. The scriptures, are, the scriptures are clear that this is happening at the harvest time and this is happening before the second coming. Because we are not, we're, we're, we're told here that the people are not being gathered to Christ in the clouds, but they are being gathered back to where? To the land of promise. Do you see that? To get this work done, to get this work done, mm -hmm. we are to be at first many fishers. The many fishers. Then the many hunters. Right. Thus it is that the first fruits are to be gathered one by one. That's another very important point, brethren. Is it? At first, the many fishers and then the many hunters. So, thus it is that the first fruits or the 140,000 are to be gathered one by one. Because if you are fishing and you are using, you know, like the, 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 you know, the fishing rod, you are catching one fish at a time. If you are hunting, you are actually following the tracks of an animal, etc. Is it? So, the first fruits are to be gathered one by one. What does that mean? It means that our salvation is an individual thing. We won't be served as a church. We won't, maybe in some places even won't be served as families. Because there is a parable which is likened, whereby the, you know, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a net, cast into the sea, catches fishes, because fishes go in families. But when now the fish had been drawn to shore, what happened? There was now a wake of separation to say, good fish, bad fish, these are all coming from the same family or from the same church, or from the same denomination, or from your own friends. But when it comes to salvation, it is an individual thing. You remember when Christ said, remember Lord's wife? Because when Lord's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt, the husband continued looking ahead. Even the children, the two daughters. The others were left in, in, in Sodom. Can you see that? Finish it up, we hear, we hear more it says. We are now, we are now in the hunting days. Mm -hmm. Going from city to city, right. from village to village, mm -hmm. from door to door, right. a thing 
which has never before been done. So now, this is what used to happen during those days, you know, because, but now what God has done, God has made sure that, you know, the development of the internet, you know, the development of these platforms, that, such that the message lightens the whole earth with the glory of God. Each and every individual hears this message for, you know, for him or for himself and decides, you know, about salvation or about being lost individually. Do you see that? What else does it say? Besides, okay. Bes besides fishing, uh -huh. besides fishing and hunting, right. we also are to make a highway for the remnant of his people. Uh -huh. We shall be left after the first fruit are gathered from Assyria, uh -huh. like as it was to Israel in the days that he came up out of the land of Egypt. So now, God is saying that besides doing this work of gathering, you know, the children of God throughout the whole world, our duty also is to make a highway. You know, when, when, when people say that this is a highway, it is a road which is actually has been made, you know, so that there is fast traffic actually moving there. Can you see that? So what, what does it mean? What does this imply? It means that God has given us a task of showing the example of returning to the land such that even others who are looking can say, surely this can be done. Because in a highway, you see the, the traffic is moving so fast. So to those who are actually in the house of David, God is saying that we have a task of what? Of showing that example, of making that highway so that others can, what? can follow. Because if we cannot do this thing, then others will say, oh, <laughs> see, they are even failing to keep their gospel. Do you see that? So we have a very important task, brethren, in this time of the harvest. And this task, as we, we read before, that is even more grand, is even more solemn than when they came out of, what? When they came out of Egypt out of Babylon, or even out of Egypt, going back to, to Canaan. So, brethren, uh, we will not go much, as I said, because uh, we've learned so much throughout these, these two Sabbaths, from the seventh Sabbath into the ceremonial of Pentecost. But in the nutshell, this is what God is telling us, uh, is the work which is taking place, right? In this time of uh, the harvest, and this is the part, or this is, the, you know, the, the, what, what the house of David is doing, isn't it? And when this work is going forward, it is our privilege, brethren, to recognize this work and to pray that we also become part of this work and we are sealed for the kingdom of God. Not to listen to the voice of man, because remember, the, the, the mark of the beast is the mark of a man. Not to listen to the voice of man, but to listen to the voice of God, to listen to, you know, to follow this work of what? Of, of restoring the past to dwell in. Rebuilding the true worship of God as we are keeping the ceremony of Pentecost today. Bringing back all those that old time religion which has been lost throughout the ages. So with these words, brethren, may God help us uh, that we may be sealed for the kingdom, that we may work for our salvation, we may work for the salvation of our families and those who are nearby to us, so that we may be accounted as good and faithful workmen. Once more, a blessed feast of ceremony at Pentecost, and may God bless you all. Let's go.